So I'm here with one of my one of my favorite friends in the dental industry, a, a true expert. Um, not only are you a dentist, but you've trained hundreds, if not thousands, of 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 sales reps with some of the largest and and most most well known brands in the dental industry. So I wanted to introduce uh, Dr. Tony Stefanu. Thanks for joining us for a minute here, Tony. Good to be here, Travis. So you teach a class, and I wanted to highlight this for the people that um, that are on here um, around selling to dentists, right? I, you know, and um, you and I have talked about uh, really expanding this out to an audience of some of the people that are, I think, that are on the on this uh, meeting right now. So let's talk about just real briefly here about the fourteen cardinal rules of selling to dentists. So take us through your list here. Yeah, and this is pretty much what the program is. I mean, the program uh, in the past, you know, it's a, it's kind of a workshop and we've done this now. I've been doing it for 20 something years. It's evolved now to now we have uh, a complete program in place and, and the 14 cardinal rules is where we're at right now. And this is really the overview of what the program looks like as a whole. But, you know, the bottom line is this, as we go through this list very quickly, uh, the the truth is, it doesn't matter what you're selling the dentist. You can be selling a consulting service. You can be selling a burr. You could be selling a laser to them. Everybody has the same challenges. Uh, how do they message accordingly in their sales and marketing conversations in order to get their attention? And everybody kind of does it the same way. And we're still very much stuck in the 1980s and 90s. Like you find the pain, which is really ironic in the dental industry. And you kind of hit the dentist over the head with it. And uh, that really doesn't work well. So to be honest, uh, this is something that we've compiled and we've kind of revised over the years. And I'm going to go through it very quickly now. Um, and and this is really and what mind, the program- Tony, the people that are on are mostly marketing agencies, which are really the yeah. people that probably contact dentists the most. So they have the most barriers to entry when they're trying to sell to dentists. Well, there's no question about it. And, and, and you know, again, the, the challenges are great. And if you're a marketing agency, of course, uh, you know, uh, the bottom line is dentists get bombarded with some of that. So here's really the look at it. Uh, number one is, is one of my favorites because the truth of the matter is we're always trying to figure out, I always get asked, how do you close? Because everybody talks about the sales cycle. And the feeling is this, it's not really the close, it's the open. If you open correctly, uh, the dentist will tell you when it's time to close. But the truth is this, you have really two conversations, two conversations uh, with a dentist and whether they know or not, whether they're going to do business with you. Uh, they may end up having to speak with you seven times because they're not ready to give you their credit card. But it really is the open. So we, we really talk about how do you prepare? What do you have to accomplish in your first conversation in order to get this to the second conversation? Number two, positivity, not negativity. Um, People market their services to dentists uh, very often in a negative manner. They have something that says something like free report, the three mistakes you're making in your hygiene department. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a negative message. It's almost scolding them. It's, it's kind of, it just has negativity all over it. I always believe, and in and my experience as a dentist and selling to dentists is that um, anything you can say negatively, you can say positively. And that will immediately separate you from your competitors if you're trying to get business with a dentist. And of course, we give you know specific examples of what that looks like. Number three, the big one, and I'm not spending any more time on it other than to say it twice here. And this is the one that you have to really focus on. Dentists don't buy what they need. They buy what they want. They need a lot of things. They can't buy everything they need for a lot of reasons. And we cover why that is. They buy what they want. Just like in our own lives, we buy what we want. Um, if somebody tells you, you need this, uh, think about it. Uh, mm -hmm. we buy what we want. Dentists buy what they want. Number four, every dental office is different. Um, scripts don't really work well. So, and, and there are a lot of reasons for that, which we can't cover here right now, but every office is different in that you can't approach every office. And part of it is just very simple. We're talking about tens and tens of thousands of dental offices in within the same zip code in the same building. The Dr. Smith and Dr. Johnson right next door to each other have completely different types of setups. The dynamics are different. Who's answering the phone is different. So we, we've got to take that and, 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 and keep that in perspective. Mm -hmm. Number five, do what the others aren't doing. That means everything. Like instead of sending them a huge amount of information about who you are and patting yourself on the back, um, and, you know, uh, instead of asking the same questions, 
um, do things a little differently. We, we kind of explain how to differentiate yourself so that the dentist has a listening for you. Number six, another one of the big ones. Um, and again, this is covered in detail. General dentists in particular, they're either emotional or financial buyers. We call them E's and F's. They're not both. So your job is to figure out early in a conversation, are they an E or are they an F? And then, and then message accordingly. Um, and, and that's a very important component of this. And it's, it, and it's almost split in half in, in, in the number of dentists in the country. Everybody thinks they're probably financial buyers. It's not really the case. Mm -hmm. uh, number seven, dentists use and have more than one option for everything they do. Um, and if you think about that, if, you, if, you, if they're doing a procedure and they have to cement something, they have five cements in their drawer. Um, they may have uh, uh, several different consultants that they use. They may have several different types of um, you know, clear aligner uh, programs that they offer. Um, they don't usually do one. And you have to keep that in mind because if you're trying to get them to replace what they've already invested into, um, sometimes they will push back from that. So you have to, you have to keep that in mind in the communications. Um, it's somewhat of a psychological and um, subconscious type of thing, but it's important to recognize in the selling process to dentists. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, where are we now? We're going on to number eight. Don't bring, up well, the don't bring up the competition unless they do. Um, and there are reasons for that. But we, we, we very often assume the dentist knows your competition. And, and all of a sudden now you made, you've made that introduction to them. So they ask you a question, you answer it. But that's a, an important point. I think it's something that a lot of companies uh, and individuals do. And uh, it puts them uh, basically at a disadvantage. Um, let them know who you know who they are. I mean, before you pick up the phone and speak with them or you meet with them, know something about them. Everybody wants to be acknowledged for something or known. Not, again, and it goes back to the script thing. If you sound like a robot, um, it, it's going to come off that way to them and they're, they're not going to feel important and they're going to be not really uh, as open to engaging in a conversation. And number 10, this isn't yeah. always the uh, case. Tony, just real quick on that one. A lot of the people that are on and that are selling are also local um, marketing agencies. So I, I always tell them, start with your own dentist, talk to your own dentist and get some sort of kind of performance basis with your own dentist as a starting point if, they, if they're just trying to break into the industry, right? Um, so I, I think that's a, that, that you know the area because they're local marketing agencies, which gives them the leg up because they're not in the same category as the cookie cutter agencies that are just trying to blast it out. I think that's a huge opportunity for these, these smaller agencies is to start with your dentist, make sure it's a great experience for him, build a great testimonial because also dentists buy from other dentists and they want referrals, right? So well, there's no question. And, you know, even, and, you know, it's funny, you mentioned like testimonials and stuff, and there, there's an art and science to that as well. Another, another aspect of the program that we cover, but um, you know, it, it, look, bottom line is we're talking specifically about dental offices here. You know, everybody wants to kind of feel like you're, they're being spoken to in a way where they, you know, you have uh, a feel for who they are and, and you, and you kind of let them know that uh, right up front. Uh, and really kind of opens up a conversation. Number 10 is show them the short and long-term benefits. And that's if you can. There are, there are some, some programs or some services or products where it's a little bit more difficult, but if there's a short-term benefit, like, hey, your practice will immediately start collecting more. That's a short-term benefit. Uh, long-term is your practice will be worth more. So that's an example of a short and long-term benefit. Yeah. Number 11 agencies, yeah. what we suggest that they do is do a reactivation campaign, which is basically built kind of more in the short term, right? They get a big burst of revenue because they're reactivating patients that may not have been in. And the beauty of the, this platform is they can do it via text and email, and it has some automated follow-up as well. And then with the integration to the practice management system, it pulls out the relevant people, and then you can speak to them about the relevance of it as a, as a you know, the patients in a relevant way, right? Absolutely. And I think, I think it's important that uh, when you're in conversation with a dentist that uh, they're, able, they're able to see this as more than one dimensional. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and so I, I, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm keeping it somewhat general here, but you know, yeah. if you can, if you can show a short and long-term aspect 
of what it is you do, uh, you know, they immediately, you know, it's like owning a home. Uh, when you own a home, uh, you make an improvement to the home that does help your quality of life short term. But what does it also do? It increases the value of the home long term. It's yeah. the same thing. Um, number 11, they don't buy generally on logic or science. And, you know, I work a lot with companies that have great products and they just hit them over the head with all the features of, and here's our study. Here's a study that shows us to be the best at this and this, this, and this. You know, logic and science are important uh, in the sense that, yes, uh, if, if science comes into play in what you sell, you have to have the science back in you. But that is not really what the sales conversation is about. And we'll leave it at that for now, because there's a lot behind all of that, and it's not applicable as much here. Um, number 12, someone someone will cost less than you do. And I think that's important as well. If you try to just market yourself on pricing, my surveys have shown, I've been doing these surveys for 20-something years, pricing is actually the third most important reason that they would buy from you. So yeah, you have to be careful, because even if you start drop, dropping your price in order to, you know, to, to get more accounts, we know this, and it's a general rule of thumb in business. Somebody's going to come along and undercut you at some point. Yeah. Um, and Tony, by the way, we'll say that the other, the number one and number two are things that they can look forward to learning when they get deeper into the class with us, right? Or with you. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, this is just the, this is the uh, list of the cardinal rules that we cover yeah. in, in depth. Um, 13, keep reminding them of their why. Hmm. there will be a reason why they continue to speak with you. And you can't just assume that, you know, a few months later when you have to keep following up a few times, even if they, they generally will know if they want to buy from you or not. But when it's time to plunk down their credit card, dentists get amnesia. And it's not, I'm not trying to, you know, be tough on them. I'm one of them. And I, I know that's the case. They do have a lot going on. But in a sense, you have to know, you have to really know what it is that they, they told you in those first conversations as to what their interest level is, as to, as to why they keep talking to you. And you have to remind them, especially when it's at the close, remind them one more time to give them some peace of mind. Mm -hmm. So we get examples of that as well. And the last one on the list, ask how they want to be communicated with. And the reason this is so important is very simple. In today's day and age, you're speaking to a dental office especially a larger office, probably has three generations of people working in it. Mm -hmm. you, the dentist could be a baby boomer and the office manager could be a Gen X and a millennials up front or whatever it might be. And, you know, you, you, can't, you can't communicate with them only the way it's most convenient for you. You should always ask them, what, you know, they're going to want maybe more information about your program. You ask them, how, do you, how would you like to receive it? I know it sounds logical to say that, and I'm amazed at how many people are like, no, the only way we do it is by email. And if they don't like it, it's too bad. I'm like, well, that, that's not how you, that's yeah. not how you sell this to Dennis. So yeah. anyway, that's, those are the cardinal rules. You got the Snapchat generation, the Instagram generation, the Facebook generation, and the no social media generation all within the same office. And, uh, you know, Tony, right. I mean, I, I really appreciate that. Obviously, I'll make sure um, everybody knows how to uh, get in touch with you. The one last question we'll kind of end with this is, you know, it's a question that we that, that we deal with a lot is how to get through the gatekeeper. And I know that there's no silver bullet because I've literally asked hundreds of dental sales and marketing people this question. But in your mind, kind of last question is, you know, what is your, your top two or three tips on getting through that gatekeeper, which is typically holding back everything from the dentist? I didn't even know you were going to ask me that, but I'm, I'm not sorry. surprised. No, I, I'm not surprised, Travis, because when I put out a questionnaire to the people that enroll in my courses, that's always the number one thing that they want to get out of the course. Oh, I, I will say this, though, um, in, in all seriousness, I'll tell you what not to do. And, and that is don't try to trick them. Yeah. Um, that's the biggest problem that we face is that the people call and they make believe that the dentist is expecting their call or that they're a friend of the dentist or whatever it may be. And you know what? They've heard every trick in the book. And, and the other part of this is, and, and do, I do, I really do cover this in more detail, of course, but the other part is it sounds silly to just say befriend them, but you have to, and I'll tell you why, because two reasons. The first one is you really don't know yet in many cases what the, what the situation is. Mm -hmm. and, and that is that, you know, it's not just that, you know, I was, you know, 15, 20% might be a spouse. 
uh, and you know, it's not just that the you know the dentist is male and it's, it's the wife. It's now the husband is the office manager and the wife's a dentist. Or mm-hmm. you know, we have all these situations, but who's answering the phone? The gatekeeper. We don't know the relation. We don't know whether they're an owner. We don't know whether they're tied into production in the office. We don't know any of those things. Are they a real decision maker? Or are they not? And it doesn't really matter. So the thing is, you have to befriend them. And I always talk about in the course that you don't say anything in the initial. First of all, you put them at ease. They're under a lot of pressure. They, they're multitasking. You let them know. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to get the dentist on the phone right now. Mm. Uh, and you joke with them a little bit. You're friendly, professional, and we give you some things to kind of ease the conversation in the course. But the bottom line is, you you, you have to have. You you can't just have the scripted because you can't just automatically assume that that person doesn't own the practice or does not make decisions. Mm -hmm. So that's really what it comes down to. And, you know, there's a lot of little kind of, um, you know, I don't want to say cutesy things, but there there are some things that really can separate you from other people because everybody's trying to get past them and uh, they know it and it starts the conversation off in in a terrible manner. So no, Tony, this is a lot of nuggets of information and, uh, look forward to to working with you to get more of this type of information out to this audience and appreciate your time, buddy. Thank you so much. Thanks, Travis. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you.